Hey, thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry, where I'm about to show you how to make one of these for all of these. With one of these. Some viewers will remember that I made a shop size caddy for larger bottles of Starbond CA glue and an aerosol accelerator a while back. It's a great caddy that I use daily when I'm working here in the shop, but it can be a bit inconvenient to take in my toolbox, and the larger bottles are a bit bulky to carry in a tool pouch. So I came up with this design for smaller, more portable bottle sizes that fit easier in my tool pouch and they're easier to carry in the toolbox. Later in the video, I'll tell you about a great offer from Starbond for a CA glue to go package that has one ounce bottles of thin, medium, and thick CA glue and a two ounce pump spray accelerator that fit perfectly in this little CA glue to go caddy. I really like the new nozzle that they just came up with for the pump spray accelerators and I'll tell you more about that later in the video too. I think you'll be surprised by at least a few of the unusual methods that I use to make this little caddy for a CA glue to go. So I'll start with a unique and rather unusual process for making this little template. Do keep in mind that in the end your glue caddy will only be as good as the template so take your time and get it right. For full disclosure as I was developing the caddy's design and making this template it took me four separate tries to come up with one that was accurate enough to use in this video. Watching the steps and sequence I developed while making all those mistakes should help you streamline the process and get your template done with fewer rejects in the scrap bin. As another bit of FYI, I'm using quarter inch MDF with white melamine faces, but you can use other material of similar thickness and density like masonite or plywood if you don't have access to this stuff. Just make sure corners are square and edges parallel on the piece you'll make your template from. The first step for making the template is drawing the template and the first step for drawing the template is to use a compass to draw a circle for the outside diameter of the caddy itself on this piece of MDF for the pattern. So to start out use a compass set to 2 and 3 8 inch radius to draw a circle 4 and 3 quarter inches in diameter near the center of your template piece. Make a point to press hard on the compass point to leave a distinct center point for all of these circles. They're important for the steps to come. Next, use a 60 slash 30 degree drafting square to draw three center lines 120 degrees apart to make six radial lines 60 degrees from each other to lay out three segments of the caddy. Now set a compass to a one inch radius and using the intersection between the four and three quarter inch circle and every other center line, draw two inch diameter circles for three edge contour notches. Remember to push hard on the compass's center point to make a distinct center point for each of these circles. I'll add a bit of caution here for anyone used to working with metric dimensions. You might want to plug your ears at this point because this next little bit of math might make your head explode. I need to draw a couple circles that are 1 and 7 16 inches in diameter. So I'll set my compass to half that dimension or 23 30 seconds, which is just 1 30 second of an inch less than 3 quarters of an inch. Got it? Yeah, I can do all that simple math in my head all by my own self. I carefully set the compass using tiny marks on a stainless steel rule and then use this setting to draw a 1 and 7 16 inch diameter center circle, that's a 23 30 second inch radius, smack dab in the center of the caddy pattern for the bottle of accelerator. Boom! Next, I set the compass to exactly 1 and a half inches to draw a 3 inch diameter circle around the template's center for bottle hole center points. And you can see as I draw each of these circles, I'm using the previously established center point so the circles come out perfectly concentric. On three center lines between three edge contour notches, use the drafting square again to draw perpendicular center lines for oval bottle centers at the intersection of the straight lines and that three inch diameter circle. Now it's time to add three quarter inch diameter circles spaced to one and seven sixteenths inches outside to outside for the total oval bottle width. So reset the compass again to 23 30 seconds of an inch and for everyone who insists that the metric system is so much simpler, set your compass to 18.25635 millimeters and draw two arcs that cross the center lines we just drew. Note that I'm making an imprint with the compass's center point for all these marks as well. To lay out centers for these 3 quarter inch diameter circles, change the compass setting to 3 eighths of an inch and add two more arcs that cross the center lines 
using the little arcs we just drew. And I'll do this six times, twice for each of the three bottles. After that, use the same 3 8 inch compass setting and those arc intersections to draw arcs 3 quarters of an inch in diameter for the oval glue bottle sides. Firmly push the compass's center point here too, and you only need to draw partial circles for each of these. Are you starting to see why it took me four attempts to lay out this pattern accurately in the beginning? Next, readjust the compass to half an inch and, at the intersecting center lines, draw one inch circles for bottle center through holes. If I'm doing a good job of explaining this and you're able to follow along, your template drawing should look just like this close-up shot at this stage of the game. To finish drawing the template, take a socket that has a 3 quarter inch outside diameter, align it tangent to the outer circle and contour notches, and draw small arcs that round off these six sharp corners of the template. There's got to be a bit of irony in the fact that I'm using a 14 millimeter socket for this operation. Now that this template is all laid out, you might assume I'll tackle it with a scroll saw, which I certainly could do, but I'm going to apply some of the unusual methods that I mentioned earlier and start cutting this out with Forstner bits and a drill press of all things. By the way, I'll be using all Forstner bits to cut out the circles that we just laid out on this template, starting with 3 quarter inch and then also using 1 inch, 1 and 7 16 and 2 inch. I use Forstner bits for this because their fine point makes it easy to align up with the compass center points that we marked on the template, and their overall design means they cut crisp, clean holes that make them exceptionally suited for cutting out templates. For easy, accurate hole drilling, I hit each center point on the template with the tip of a sharp punch like this. It makes Forstner bit alignment easier by giving their fine tip a defined point to register to. I find this much easier than trying to line up the tip with a plain pencil mark. I guess you could say that that's a pro tip tip. Right? To put a surgically rated point on this old Dasco Pro punch, I use a fine mill file to tune it up. I use smooth even strokes and try to rotate the punch just slightly as I file, and it only takes seconds to dial the point in to an incredible degree of sharpness. With a precision tip, I can feel the point register with the little imprint in the face of the MDF that was left by the compass's center point, and all these little steps ensure the high degree of accuracy I want out of this template. I start by chucking the 1 and 7 16 inch diameter Forstner bit into the drill press to drill the center hole first. I make sure to use a clean flat spot on my sacrificial drill press table so that the holes come out clean on the back side of the template. Notice I lower the bit gradually when it gets close to the surface of the template so I can wiggle the piece around and make sure the dimple left by the punch is engaged by the tip of the Forstner bit. Once the tip is engaged in that little dimple, the template is virtually locked in place with the bit's center on the hole's center to make the location of these drilled holes consistently accurate. After that, I follow with six holes, three quarter inches in diameter for the sides of the oval bottle holes. Using Forstner bits and a drill press like this makes super quick work of making very accurate holes in a small template. This can be done with a scroll saw and a lot of patience, but even though I have a scroll saw, I lack the patience for doing it that way. Since the center point is gone, I carefully line up the outside diameter of the bit with the drawn circle which is something you can only do with Forstner style bits, and drill these three holes. Forstner bits are designed with a sharp rim for guiding holes drilled just like this, which is another reason that they're so useful, because they don't need to rely on the pilot point for drilling partial holes like these. The last step for cutting out this template on the drill press is to switch to that large 2 inch diameter drill bit and drill three holes for the caddy's contour notches. And look at that perfect little circle of white melamine that I just cut out. About looks like a melamine potato chip. Once all the holes are drilled, use a coping saw, jigsaw, scroll saw, or bandsaw to cut just proud of the outer size of the template. I'm using a bandsaw because I can, but the half inch blade that I have in it right now is just a little wide for cutting a radius this tight smoothly. But with a little creative carpentry technique, I still get the job done quickly, accurately, and easy. While I'm here with the bandsaw running, I'll use the arcs I drew using that 14 millimeter socket as a guide to remove the bulk of the material I need to remove for rounding off the six corners of the template. Rut row, I nicked the template. 
Does that mean I have to start over? Nope. Of course not, because I've got bottles of Starbond glue that go in this caddy, and I'll use those to bail me out. Fixing a nick in a template at this late stage of the game is a real lifesaver, and with Starbond glue, it barely takes a minute to fix a boo-boo instead of having to start all over. For a nick this size, I find a suitable scrap of the melamine I just cut off that fits into this little nick. Give it a spritz of accelerator, put a few dabs of the medium CA into the nick, put the scrap into the nick, hold it for 10 seconds, redraw the contour line, and then recut the contour line like I should have done in the first place. After fixing that fracas, I use an 80 grit best block for demanding sanding to fair these curves and establish the outer contour of the caddy template. A sharp 80 grit belt on this block is coarse enough to make quick work of the job, but not so coarse as to tear up the backside of the template. I focus to keep the edges square to the face and keep sanding till about half of the pencil line is gone. And that will give a nice, smooth, consistent shape to the outside of the template and ultimately the outside of the caddy. Next, clamp the template in a vise and use rat tail and half round files to clean up oval bottle holes for the one ounce bottles of Starbond CA glue. Use a bottle as a guide to make sure you get a good fit between the bottle and the template. And you can see as I file these holes, even though they're on my fifth template, that I got the overall width of the bottle holes a little bit tight at inch and three eighths. So I've got extra filing to do here, where if I had drilled those holes just a little farther apart, I could have saved myself extra effort at this stage. I continue to go back and forth between file and trial until I get each of the oval bottle holes to just the right size for a snug fit. Even though this process is a bit tedious, Sharp files make quick work of changing the size of these oval holes, and it's much easier to alter the size of the holes in the template than it is to alter the size of the holes in the caddy later. And I think I'll call that good. Once you're satisfied with the template's shape, use a 100 grit sandpaper to smooth off the edges and the curves to make sure everything is smooth. After you've done this step, your template should look a lot like this. I want to pause for a minute to congratulate viewers that have made it through the template layout and cutting process. It's a bit of a tricky job, and if you like a challenge like this, I'll ask that you'd consider subscribing to Next Level Carpentry if you haven't already. It's free, of course, and as a subscriber, you're on the short list to be notified every time a video like this is uploaded to the channel. If you happen to like this particular video, please hit the thumbs up button with whatever blunt object you happen to have at hand, if you think it's worthy of a thumbs up thump, and I'll thank you for both. I'm also jazzed to tell you that Starbon put together a special special offer code to coincide with the release of this Glue Caddy build video. For a limited time of 45 days, you can get a full 25% off the CA Glue To Go product bundle by using special offer code NLC25 during checkout at Starbond.com. This is the best offer yet from Starbond for next level carpentry, so jump on it while it lasts. This special 45 day long 25% off offer code also applies to other product bundles on the Starbond.com website in case you need to restock a shop size caddy like this from the previous build video here on Next Level Carpentry. As I mentioned earlier, Starbond recently upgraded the nozzle design for the pump spray accelerator from this old style that produced weak mist and was prone to spitting to this unique new style affectionately known as the Pinocchio nozzle. I really like this new nozzle design because it shoots a robust spray that's fully atomized for thorough, consistent, and even coverage. Even though I still prefer aerosol activator when working in the shop, the compact size and excellent atomization of the two ounce pump spray bottle makes it my go-to for CA glue to go for use on the job site. So I don't leave home without it. And while you're riveted by this annoying bit of self-promotion, I want to let you know that there's a link in the video's description below to an Amazon Influencers page with tools and supplies you see used in this video. All this stuff is available at the same low online cost you've come to expect from Amazon, but poor old Jeff Bezos has to relinquish a molecular fraction of his income because Amazon pays equally small ad fees from his profit margin to Next Level Carpentry because I annoy you by mentioning this. For anyone watching this barrage of marketing, I'm sure you'll be thrilled to know you can get swag like the t-shirt I'm wearing here and signs and posters from around the shop through a link to Spring in the video description as well. 
At this time, I want to congratulate both of you viewers who endured this extended sales pitch. And as a reward for your perseverance, I'm going to show you how to make a CA glue to go caddy out of a block of wood using this cute little template. Finally, now that your template's complete, it's time to make the caddy. One and three quarter inches is a good thickness for this little caddy, which can be made out of a solid piece of eight quarter stock, somewhat bigger than the template. Here on the channel, I've got a reputation for taking things to the next level that I need to uphold, so I sandwiched a layer of six millimeter Russian birch plywood between two layers of mesquite to make the inch and three quarter blank I'll use in this video. For better proportions, I made the top layer of the blank one inch as thick and the bottom layer a little over a half inch thick, but a chunk of solid wood with nice grain works just as well. The first step for making the caddy is to attach the template to the blank. I don't trust double stick tape on a template like this, so I use two number 18 by 5 8 inch long nails placed strategically on center lines to do the job. That way the template is fastened securely to the blank with no chance of movement. And on this particular block of mesquite, I've placed the template strategically to miss this deep fissure in the block of wood and hopefully capitalize on some beautiful grain on this unique piece of mesquite. With the template in place, use it as a guide to drill the 1 and 7 16 inch diameter center hole one and a half inches deep. This leaves a lip in the bottom of the hole to keep the pump spray bottle of Starbond Accelerator from falling through the block, making this a caddy instead of a useless block of pretty wood with holes drilled in it. Now I'll switch to the 3 quarter inch diameter Forstner bit Reset the depth to 1 and 3 eighths inches deep and drill six holes for the sides of the oval bottles. To line up the holes, just locate the side of the spinning bit in the side of the oval hole in the template and drill the holes. At this point, it's okay if there's a little lip between the hole in the template and the hole in the caddy block because a flush trim router bit will clean out the inside of this oval perfectly in an upcoming step. For all these drilling steps, do as I say and not as I do and maintain a firm grip on the piece, or if you're uncomfortable with that or are smarter than me, clamp the piece in place as you drill each of these holes, because it's easy to get injured by a spinning block of hardwood. Next, switch to a one inch bit set to drill holes all the way through the center of each bottle location. This removes the bulk of the wood for the CA glue bottle holes, creates a lip to hold them in place, and also keeps detritus from building up in the bottom of the holes over time. For a better grip on the block while I'm drilling these one inch holes all the way through, I've added a strong 12 inch squeeze clamp to hold the block and increase my gripping strength. I'm comfortable doing this, but I advise all viewers who aren't comfortable with a setup like this to use whatever clamps and hold downs are necessary to make drilling these holes safe and accurate. I'm sure that you heard that, and the only thing screaming louder than Viewers screaming at their screen was my conscience screaming at me for the way I was drilling those holes. When I did the other block, I was able to easily hold that block in place. This has got more difficult grain, and the way I was doing this was just plain old stupid. So uh, I stopped. I'm going to set up this other clamp setup. Uh, anybody that has clamps that go directly into the drill press table, uh, use that. Just use something to hold that block in place and pretend that this is the way I started doing this in the first place because it's responsible and that wasn't. As with most safety measures, the time and effort it takes to make something safe is so absurdly small compared to the consequences of an operation gone bad that it's just foolish not to do them. And as you can see here, a couple clamps and a block of wood eliminates the risk I was exposed to just holding the block by hand. All done, all drilled, no fault, no foul. And now, for the same purpose, using the same bit, same setup, and same depth, align the bit center with the center hole center and drill all the way through it too. Just like that. The last drilling step is to switch to the two inch diameter Forstner bit and drill three holes, full depth, to establish the caddy's contour. Taking my own lecture and advice to heart, I make sure to be careful with my setup here to make sure the block is secure before boring these large holes in this small block because the ratio of hole size to workpiece size is ripe for a fracas if it gets away from me. I should mention that I'm using the quill lock feature of this old Delta drill press to hold the bit in the down position precisely where I want to drill the hole. This holds the bit and the workpiece firmly in place while I torque down the clamps that will hold the block here for the drilling process. 
Make sure you're comfortable with your setup so that you can proceed with confidence and caution to drill the holes. I'll slow down the drill speed for drilling these large holes and when the bit warms up, melt the bit of wax on the perimeter of the bit to make drilling the hole through this dense hardwood easier on the bit, the drill press, and my nerves. Two down, one to go. I rearranged the clamping setup slightly for each of these different holes, but the beauty of it is that the Forstner bit's design makes it well suited for drilling partial holes in an odd shaped block like this. And believe it or not, this crazy looking block is exactly what it's supposed to look like at this stage of the game. And with all those drilling steps done, it's time to switch to router mode. Everyone with a router table will have an easier time with this operation, but I'll be using this Bosch Colt palm router to show it can be done, and because I don't currently have a functioning router table in the shop. Plus, this is the way I learned to do things before there was such a thing as a router table. I'll start with this stubby CMT top bearing router bit to start shaping the glue bottle holes to match the template. The heads of those little nails were sticking up ever so slightly and making the router's base catch while sliding around on the template, but a couple of licks with a file knocks them down so that the router can slide smoothly over the template and do a better job of flush trimming the holes. I start and stop the router with the bit dropped into the center of the hole to minimize risk of nicking the template and spoiling the piece. I'll finish this step later with the template removed, but for now I make a couple of passes to clean up the first half inch or so of the oval glue bottle holes. Since there's so little difference in the shape of this hole versus the holes drilled by the Forstner bits, the router isn't taking off much material, making these cleanup passes pretty easy. Next, I go back to the bandsaw to cut excess material off the outer diameter of the caddy blank. At the bandsaw, I carefully cut just a little bit proud of the template on all three of the sections of the glue caddy. I take my time to leave just a slight margin, but at the same time to avoid nicking the template. At this stage, with those large chunks trimmed off, the caddy looks a bit like a ninja throwing star, so to make the caddy a little more user friendly, I cut a little proud of the three quarter inch diameter outline of the template on the radius corners too. If you choose to go with a ninja throwing star design, just skip this step. After off cutting the shape on the bandsaw, I go back to using the router and flush trim bit to transfer the template's contour onto the outside of the block. As a redundant reminder, I check the router bit's depth setting to make sure the bearing is riding on the template so that the router is doing the job I need it to at this point. Did you see that little chip fly out of there when I routed that edge? I see it as a serendipitous event because it's a perfect example for the use of Starbond glue for repairing small inevitable chips when routing brittle hardwood like this. Making repairs like this on the fly with Starbond CA glue is easy peasy. I just reposition the block in the vise. This piece actually has a double split so I'm going to glue the first part of the split first with the thin CA glue. Spritz the chip with accelerator, cover the chipped surface with medium CA glue, and then press the chip into place, holding it firm for 10 seconds. After 10 seconds, I can just reposition the block as it was, and then carefully reroute over the chipped piece. I've got to use a little slower feed rate the second time, because the edges of the chip make it easy to snag and catch, especially if the router bit isn't brand new sharp. But as you can see, the repair is complete and it's all good to go. Once I finish sanding and routing that, that repair will be invisible. Just like I did while routing the insides of the bottle holes, I'll drop the flush trim router bit down about a quarter or three eighths of an inch and make a second pass around the block to extend the finished surface farther down the outside contour of the block. And a good part of the reason why this flush trimming is so minimal is because of the clean cut I got with that two inch Forstner bit which means that almost half of the outside perimeter is already flush trimmed. And here again, this sort of operation is much easier on a router table, but with a slow feed rate, high RPM, and a steady hand, it's entirely doable freehand. I'll switch out to a pattern bit with a longer cut length and make another pass around the outside 
and then the glue bottle holes. I use a support block in the vise to keep the workpiece steady and level for making these cuts. As the depth of cut increases, I need to use more caution and make sure that my hand is steady and the router runs smoothly around the template to keep it from digging into the workpiece with that longer bit. With those passes made, it's time to remove the template from the workpiece. I do that with a putty knife, carefully wiggling, prying, and lifting to work those two nails loose and lift off the template without breaking it or damaging the workpiece. You can see that some of the CA glue seeped between the template and the workpiece where I made that repair and damaged the template a little bit. But guess what? I can fill that in with CA glue and use this pattern many more times. With the template removed, I'll take another pass which will lower this flush trim segment a quarter inch more on the outside and inside of the caddy's shape. Something to take note of with this process is that I'm using a sharp bit, high RPM, a slow feed rate, and making incremental depth cut adjustments so that every pass is a light pass and I'm easily to make it smoothly, evenly, and accurately. I'll drop the router bit another eighth of an inch to clean up the bottom of the glue bottle holes in a final pass on the inside. I use this little general depth gauge to set the router bit's depth accurately so the lips that support the glue bottles isn't too deep. And that final pass is such a shallow pass that it's effortless to clean up the bottom of the glue bottle holes. And as you can see, the bottles fit perfectly and the viscosity on the label is clearly visible with the bottles in place. The last step for trimming this caddy is to switch from a top bearing bit to a bottom bearing bit, flip the block over, and flush trim it from the bottom to clean up the bottom section of the caddy. Because the diameter of this flush trim bit is so small, that small diameter makes it more prone to chipping wood, especially brittle hard wood like this dried mesquite. So I use a really slow feed rate proceed with caution and see if I can get away with it. As you can tell, I'm really pushing the envelope of what this little bit is capable of and what I should be doing with it. And it's no surprise that it chipped off a nice chunk of mesquite there on that long grain, but as you've come to expect, I'm going to fix that with a little CA glue. I had to crawl around under the bench to find the piece, but the repair is quick and easy. Anytime I can, I'll pre-fit a chip to make sure that it fits perfectly where it needs to go and then just put a little reference line like that so that I can quickly line it up once the CA glue is on it because I've only got about three seconds to position once the accelerator and the CA glue meet. Just like before I put accelerator on the piece, CA glue on the blank, and I generally make the choice of which piece gets accelerator and which piece gets the CA glue, just based on the handling characteristics of the piece. Because of the brittle nature of this mesquite and the delicate nature of the chip, I'm putting a little extra CA around the outside to hold it in place a little more firmly, because I'm going to hit it with that same flush trim router bit and it's going to want to yank it off there again. And you can see how firmly that CA glue is set up in just seconds. I switch the position of the camera and the block in the vise so that I get a nice, slow, steady, consistent feed rate using the flush trim bit to clean this chip up. And I think I'll try a little bit of climb cutting to lower the ability of the bit to pull this piece off again. Climb cutting is running the router in the reverse direction, which minimizes the pull on the piece, but also requires a steady hand keep the router and bit from running out of control. What do you think of them apples? Like I said before, when I'm done with this block, that repair will be invisible. Another thing that a repair like this proves is that a glue joint is always stronger than the natural wood itself because the natural wood chipped off and the glued on piece didn't. The last router step is to switch to a 1 8 inch roundover bit and ease all sharp edges on the block, top and bottom. With the block clamped in the vise, this is an easy operation with the Bosch handheld router, but once again, this would be a lot simpler, a lot easier, and a good bit less nerve-wracking using a router table instead of the handheld method like I'm doing here. 
Once all those edges are eased, your caddy should look much like this, and bottles should drop easily into their respective holes. As most viewers know, sanding is the part of every project that I like the least, but with everything done in the sequence and with the tools that I've used so far, very little sanding is necessary. I use a piece of 2 inch PVC pipe with a slit cut in it to hold the 120 grit sandpaper to sand all the concave curves on the caddy. With the caddy block clamped in the vise, I start with 120 grit sandpaper to smooth up any ridges left by the routing process and remove burn marks, rust spots, and irregularities. I use the same 120 grit sandpaper on this gator sanding block that has a cushy pad on the bottom for all the flat spots and convex surfaces. You can see here that sanding quickly removes any edges or ridges left when that chip was glued on and the slight glue line will disappear once I apply the gel poly finish. This mesquite is hard, dense wood and it takes a little bit to clean up the chatter marks left by the flush trim router bit on some of the curve. But this is the hardest part of the sanding process and it's really not that bad. Once I've cleaned up all the larger surfaces, I use a piece of that same 120 grit sandpaper handheld to clean up all the edges that were routed with that 1 8 inch round over bit. I spend as much time as necessary with the 120 grit sandpaper to get everything cleaned up and shaped before proceeding to the next step. And after finishing up with that 120 grit paper on all the rounded over edges, a puff of compressed air cleans up the piece so that I can see this is ready for the next sanding step, which is switching to 180 grit paper. I do this stage handheld with a used 180 grit Abernet disc. With the 180, I go over the whole caddy to remove 120 grit scratches. This 180 grit Abernet disc is still sharp and coarse enough to do a little bit of shaping of some of the curves and edges if necessary, but even as fine as it is, it's aggressive enough to remove the 120 grit scratches with just a few wipes. When I'm done with the 180 and it's time to switch the 320 grit sandpaper, I really like this purple stuff that 3M makes. I fold the sheet crisply in half, use the sharp edge of my joiner table to tear the sheet in half, and then fold a half into thirds. Because the paper is so fine, it's hard to tell which face is used and which isn't. I use a sharpie marker to put a 1, 2, and 3 on the three faces of the paper, which helps me use each face until it's spent and avoid the problem of having three faces that are all just a little bit spent when I need to have a sharp, fresh face to sand with. To keep my glasses free of dust, when sanding handheld like this, I just quickly wipe them with a dryer sheet, which takes off the dust and the anti-static protection keeps more fine dust from building up as quickly. At this stage, wiping the block with a clean, soft cloth removes dust and also helps highlight any imperfections that might still be in the wood. They should all be gone by now, but once in a while, I'll catch a rogue 120 grit scratch lingering at this stage of the game. It'll show up when I wipe it with the rag and I can clean it up with the 320 grit paper. Beyond that, all the 320 grit paper is doing at this stage is removing scratches from the previous 180 grit sanding step. 320 grit paper leaves the wood unbelievably smooth, but as another next level touch, I'll give it a once over with 400 grit just to really bring it home. Oh yeah, that's ready for varnish. Now that's what I call smooth. <laughs> and naturally, longtime viewers of Next Level Carpentry on YouTube know what's coming next. Old Masters Satin Sheen Gel Poly Varnish and, more importantly, a soon-to-be world-famous Lintz Brothers Pizza Box to protect my bench top and to assure maximum luster on the finished sheen on the CA Glue to Go Glue Caddy. As much as I don't care for sanding, I do enjoy applying gel poly varnish over a well-sanded surface. I wear Venom Steel nitrile gloves and use paper towels to slather on a generous coat of the gel poly and spend about five minutes elapsed time letting that gel poly soak deep into this mesquite wood grain. And the moment when I daub on that first coat of varnish is the moment that reminds me why I love woodworking. You just gotta love the way that complex grain comes alive with a coat of varnish. And with the contrast between mesquite and Russian birch, I think the effort for laminating these blocks instead of using a solid chunk was well worth the extra time that it took. I spend extra time varnishing this block because of the amount of end grain involved and the end grain really soaks up extra varnish and extra varnish seals up that end grain and enhances the finish. And I think viewers will agree that the luster of this block is greatly enhanced by the fact that I'm using a Lintz Brothers pizza box on the bench top.
As I finish up wiping on that heavy coat of gel poly, I use a little bit of compressed air to blow out any that's built up on the corners and ledges deep inside the glue bottle holes. Anytime you're using this or any other varnish, make sure you dispose of the rags you used for application responsibly. Because a varnish soaked paper towel or rag will ignite by spontaneous combustion if you're negligent and leave them wadded up in a garbage can. Once I've satisfied that the varnish has done soaking into the block and I've blown out the excess, I give the whole caddy a final buff with a clean paper towel and then deftly balance the caddy on a golf ball to let the varnish dry. Once the Old Master's gel poly has had a couple hours to dry, I buff it with a piece of brown paper bag to even out the sheen of the varnish. Now that the varnish is dry and buffed a little bit, those repaired chips are, as I said, invisible. And I like the way this little bit of grain here next to that fissure in the blank ended up in the finished block to give visual interest to the caddy. Then just drop in bottles of CA glue and accelerator into the caddy and you've got CA glue to go. And before I go, I want to thank you as always. Until next time, thanks for watching. As a reward to viewers who are still watching here at the end of the end of the end, I want to show you a slick pro tip that I use to keep glue bottle tips clog free and proud. Even with careful everyday use, nozzles of even the best CA glue will eventually clog up. And I learned that a small piece of stiff wire is a great way to unclog those tips so that I can keep working. Using this special pair of dedicated wire bending pliers, I make a small loop about 3 eighths of an inch around on the end of a piece of 39 thousandths inch diameter music wire. I choose this type of wire because it's tough, which makes forming the loop a little tricky, but it's totally doable. And the stiff wire doesn't buckle in use. Once the loop is formed, I give the wire a sharp bend to form a neat little handle for the nozzle tip cleaning wire. Once the loop is formed, use a pair of side cuts, cut it off about three inches long, and use a fine file to clean up the cut end. Now I'll take a number 56 wire size drill bit and using one of the strategically placed template nail holes for location, carefully drill a hole about one and five eighths inches deep into the top of the caddy to hold the tip cleaner wire. I'm using a micro bit holder to grip the tiny 46 thousandths of an inch diameter bit and then I chuck the holder into my drill. But small adapter chucks are available for this sort of thing. After the hole is drilled, a small curve in the wire will keep it from falling out of the caddy and getting lost. With a tip cleaner on board, you can deploy the wire anytime to quickly clean plugged nozzles and keep glue flowing. Just be sure to wipe off any glue that gets on it before putting it back in the storage hole, or it'll turn from a tip cleaner into an odd handle. And that is that. Thanks so much for watching to the end of the end of the end.